Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Chris Crook, and welcome to this fourth lecture in a series looking at practical writing skills. This is probably the lecture that most people will be most interested in, as we're going to be looking at writing for business purposes. We're going to be looking at structure, use of language, things that are going to help you appear more professional in a business English context. Okay. As we've started with before, this is uh, the fourth in, in the series of five. We've looked at tone and register. We've looked at summarizing and paraphrasing. We looked in the last lecture at writing a formal report. We gave you some of the basic structure that uh, you would need to look at and some of the questions that you need to think about when you're writing a report. In this particular lecture, we're going to be looking at writing for business purposes. Um, very generic guidelines. We're not going to be, obviously I can't cater for um, what you will be looking at yourself, looking at emails that you'll be writing yourself, so I can't give you specific advice. And we'll give you a short homework task at the end of this. In the next lecture, we'll be looking at writing at writing for uh, personal statements and resumes and CVs. So in this particular lecture, we're going to be looking at using critical thinking questions to help us write business emails in a, in a more better, in, in a more better way, in a better way, I mean to say. We're going to be looking at some of the basic questions, again, all through this practical writing course. The thing has been to focus on critically appraising your own work. It's not really been um, to give you formats and to give you templates that will guarantee you success, but to be able to take away general guidelines and questions that will able, enable you to improve later on. We're going to be looking at types of structure. We're going to be looking at structuring your paragraphs, what information needs to go into those things. We're also going to be looking at structuring your sentences, using conjunctions, using connectors. Finally, we'll be looking at different types of style and we'll be looking at um, how to organize your par paragraphs. There'll be a short homework task at the end of this. Um, so let's get started. So what are our aims? Are they realistic or are they unrealistic? An unrealistic aim is to be able to write like a native English speaker. To be able to write business emails, to be able to write business presentations, um, quote unquote professional English, does require a lot of practice, okay? So we'll be looking at um, some examples from this, but we really do, I need to really kind of emphasize that to do this well, you do need to do this on a daily basis, you need to practice. Do me a favor, go and look at social media in English tell me how good those writers actually are. Um, ordinary people really don't have much of a clue when it comes to writing professional emails. They just do their best, okay? And that's really all you can do. If you're aiming to, to write like a native English speaker, um, I would say that the best thing to do is to go away and practice for about 10 or 15 years on a daily basis or you need to basically accept that there will be some um, there, there will be some kind of gap we can help you get there a little bit but we need to make sure but i need to kind of basically emphasize that there is no magic solution here okay so what do native speakers really want well they want things what what do Second language learners really want. They want to be able to use more complex sentences. They want to be able to use more sophisticated language and they want to take less time to respond. These are basically the three things I've found that, that people have been trying to aim for in, uh, in their business writing. Okay. Critical thinking, questions that you need to actually ask yourself straight away. Are you clear about your objective? All the way through in each of these lectures, I've been saying to you, make sure that you know why you're writing. That's the main thing is basically have a clear objective. What is your objective with writing this particular email, doing this particular presentation, writing this particular letter? Are you writing a letter of recommendation, for example? Make sure that you're clear about your objectives. These things can't be bashed off in a couple of minutes um, a few minutes before the deadline. Make sure that you know what your objective is. Okay. Do you have a clear structure from start to finish? Are you using KISS? Keep it simple. S keep, well, it's, it's two things. Keep it simple, stupid, or keep it short and simple. Okay. 
You need to be able to use plain and uncomplicated English when you're writing. You don't need to really bamboozle people. Remember, people don't know what you know. Five basic questions you need to ask yourself writing a business email. First of all, who are you writing to? Why are you writing to this person? There's a big difference writing to the uh, sales assistant in a shop and writing to the CEO of the company that owns the shop. There's a big difference here. You need to really sit down and think. People do this thing unconsciously. Native English speakers and native Chinese speakers will do this type of thing unconsciously. You really need to learn these things. When, when you learn something unconsciously, you have to really understand that you've done it so many times that you're not really thinking about it. And that is the key thing. You need to change from being a conscious thinker to an unconscious thinker when it comes to this. Um, you know how to talk to your parents and your family. Uh, you, need to, you know how to talk to members of your family. You know the proper register to talk to the dean of the department in Chinese. You need to learn that, but you need to learn it in English. Um, it, it just requires a lot of repetition. That's all it requires. What's the message that you're going to be conveying in this particular uh, email, in this particular letter, in this whatever you're writing, text message, okay? So what is the message that you need to convey? Um, what is the underlying emotion as well? Are you angry? Are you very, very happy? Are you, you know, what, think about, spend some time thinking about uh, what emotions need to be in that letter and how the language will change to reflect that emotional state. How much can you spend on this? How much time can you spend on this? Do you need to just quickly write a quick note to someone saying thank you? Or do you need to actually sit down and write a formal letter in the space of an afternoon? Can you dedicate an afternoon to writing one letter? These different time constraints will determine how much time you can actually spend on the letter itself. Remember, people have other things to do as well. And the last thing at the bottom, do you have the relevant information? Do you have the relevant facts? Do you have the statistics to hand? Have you gathered together the information that you need to actually give this person? If you're responding to a customer inquiry, for example, this is vitally important. What's your relationship with the reader? Are you talking to people within your organization or are you talking to customers? Obviously, if you're talking to customers, um, that are coming to you outside of your organization, you need to have a different level of politeness um, than you would. You would probably be a little bit more informal with people in your, uh, within your organization, especially if it's a small company, especially if it's a more modern internet startup, for example. You can afford to be more casual. You can afford to be more informal. There. What's the position in the hierarchy of the company? Are they your superiors or are you giving information to um, people who are working underneath you. You need to think about that. Again, think about the tone, think about the register. Do you need to be polite? How polite is polite? Um, think about these things. Um, you might even have a close relationship with someone who is the CEO. Um, you need to you know, think about that relationship. How can you change the your register? How can you change your actual way of speaking? And is that way of speaking um, appropriate? One of the things that I would recommend is that you go and look at the Apple keynote speeches at the developers conferences. There is a certain level of formality there, but they always try and project the impression, always try to project the image that Apple is a relatively young, uh, informal uh, group of um, forward-thinking liberals um, that have this very informal structure. In fact, it's probably just as formal and just as, as tightly structured as any other company. It's, it's basically, it's a big company, so it needs, it needs that. At these points of contact with the consumers, at these points of contact with the investors, um, they need to project a certain image and the language that they use reflects that. So think about the tone, think about whether you need to be polite, you need to be friendly, you need to be formal, you need to be um, in, a, in, a, in a really strict tone where you're reprimanding someone. Um, a customer is making a complaint, how would you deal with that? All of these things are being reflected in the language choices that you make. And what is the objective of uh, the piece of written work that you're producing? Are you going to be informing people? Are you going to be persuading people? Is it going to be a presentation? You're going to be focusing on the good points. You're going to be focusing on presenting yourself in the best possible light. Are you complaining about something? A letter of complaint is just as important as a letter of compliment. 
you need to make sure that you're not too emotional. You need to make sure that you're not getting too carried away and too hysterical in, the, in, these, um, in these emails, in these letters. You need to be formal, firm, and sincere in a letter of complaint. And finally, are you delivering good news or are you delivering bad news? Um, for example, the big distinction here, bad news is often um, delivered in the passive voice. It's one of the very few times that we actually use the passive voice to deliver bad news, to tell people that they've been fired, to tell people that a contract has been cancelled. We don't want to really lay blame on, people's, uh, on certain people in the organisation, but we do need to deliver what has happened. We do need to tell people that. Why are you writing? Oftentimes people are writing because the message that they want to give is usually too complex for a phone call. So there will be times in a phone call it's very, very difficult to actually go back and forth and up and down through different paragraphs looking at different pieces of information in a text message. Text messages, uh, short messages, instant messages, they're not really geared for a business environment. The point of messages that you send over WeChat or the point of messages that you send over iMessage or you know, WhatsApp messages or anything like that is basically to cut down on the number of irrelevant uh, emails that people are sending about small points. You don't need to send an email about every little small point. You can send a message like this. Don't make the mistake of delivering sincere bad news via uh, text message. No one wants to be fired via SMS. Okay. Think about why while you, while you're writing. If you need to lay out a complex story, this needs to go in an email. This needs to go in a letter. Okay. Importantly, in a lot of business context, you'll find that the document, uh, the message or the information has to be documented in some way. So for example, in the university setting like this, we need to actually make sure that people have received information about when their final exams are. So that needs to be documented. So a great example is documents from the bank. People, will, people from the bank will send you a letter saying that you've, you've gone over your limit, you've, be, you've gone overdrawn, and you've now been charged £25. If you, if you try and dispute that, everything is documented, everything is written down, everything is scanned in, and then legally you will have evidence and then you will have some standing there. Points and opinions often need to be formalised. Um, you need to take a certain stance on something, um, present it in a meeting. You can't just raise a question at the meeting and then have everybody ignore you. This is no good. Once you've written it down and once you've taken up room in someone's inbox and when you've, once you've got, a, you've got a, a letter on someone's table taking up room, it's very difficult for them to ignore that. Um, they, can, they can still ignore it, but it's a little bit more difficult than just you know, um, shouting someone down in a meeting. If a written response is needed in some way, a receipt is needed, or um, a reference number is given to, some th to someone. Uh, we're talking about sales here. Sales and um, you know, tracking orders is, is something that, that, will always, um, that will always come up in, in a business context where people will want to know what is happening. There'll be things that will happen outside of you con your control. I'm sure you've had this situation where you've ordered food um, from an online vendor and then the food has been delivered and something's missing and then they've just refunded you. You need to have a more formal paper trail, as we say, um, when it comes to tracking these things because people, people will try their luck and try and get something for nothing. In terms of the boss talking to the, uh, the staff, we do need to have a certain level of authority that needs to be established um, in, in, in what we say the food chain of an organization. Um, Ask questions, making sure that you're asking questions to the right person. Don't ask questions directly to the regional manager, for example. You need to talk to your local manager for that. Um, an email is the best way of, of establishing that particular flow within um, a certain company structure. When it comes to planning your information, uh, planning the information that needs to go into the message, think about the objective and then establish that objective. Why is someone writing to you? Okay. Why is someone writing this letter? Brainstorm the content. Take a few minutes just to write down a few ideas. Uh, point one, two, three, four, five. That's really all you need. Uh, make sure that those things go in there. Make sure that the, the actual skeleton of the message is actually in there. Okay, so brainstorm what needs to go in, what doesn't need to go in. 
Um, but during the brainstorm, remember that we're not really censoring our ideas, we're not really editing our ideas. If it's a good idea or a bad idea, it goes down. We can edit that, we can, we can cut things out later on. We don't, we don't worry about editing during the brainstorming session. Very, very briefly, you can prepare an outline. Uh, you can do this in any, any word processing package. You could probably even do it on your phone. Prepare an outline of what you'd like to lead in with, um, what you'd like to conclude with at the end, what's the final message that you'd like to leave, leave with the reader at the end of it. Um, do get into the habit of redrafting things. It really, really does help improve your English. I think it's one of the, main th one of the most important things, the key things that you can do to actually improve your written English would be to um, draft and then redraft and then rewrite. Um, remember, the first draft of everything is, is terrible, so don't be afraid of going back and reviewing your ideas. Expand on details that you wrote down in the brainstorming session, and then make sure finally that you keep to the plan. Um, salutations, friendly, friendly um, messages that establish a close rapport with the reader. These are all fine, but don't go too crazy with them. Um, don't, for example, if you're telling someone that you met them at a, at a party somewhere, don't write three or four paragraphs about what you thought of the party. Okay, that, we just don't need that kind of information. We're going to have a look at a sample email outline just to begin with. Um, so once again, pause the video, make sure that you've actually fully digested what's on here. We're going to be writing um, keynotes for a sales conference email. Um, what were the main problems here? What do we want to include in the email? We're just going to go through them point by point. Okay. First thing was there was a slow registration process for the conference. Maybe we can do that online next time. Would that be possible? We could probably include that. The speaker, Kyle Jones, had good ideas on e-sales and there's been a handout included. So again, one of the things that we get with uh, with email is that we get a more accessible way of actually attaching documents to the email so that people will be able to understand what we're actually talking about. We'll be able to take a photograph of something and actually add it. Um, it's, it is more difficult in instant messaging because messages do scroll up. It is really, really difficult. I find it really difficult anyway to actually scan through a message, scan through a list of messages, find the attachment, what person someone's talking about and then actually look at that and read the email. It's really, really tricky. And email just makes it much, much easier to do in this kind of, in this kind of um, you know, sending documents, sending examples to people. We met five possible new suppliers at the reception dinner. And the conclusion is useful input, new ideas. Okay, that's what we're going to be leaving with. So we've got a very, very straightforward, simple email talking about um, a conference, even with something this simple, even with something that you might not really think that you need to think about, we still need to do a little bit of planning. In terms of organizing our information, there are a number of different strategies that we can use. We can use a pyramid. We can go from specific all the way down to the most broad. We can actually invert the pyramid and we can start with the most specific and go towards uh, start with the most general and go towards the most specific. Um, we can use chronology. Um, chronology means that we put things in time order. Um, we can move from problem to solution. We can document a, a process. We can document a sequence, um, the, the way we start at the beginning and then we move through to the end. Um, and finally, we can actually structure our uh, emails in a, a, a story. We can we can give a narrative to that. Um, we can start with the middle, start with the beginning, move on to the middle, and then finish with the end. And then we'll we'll uh, we'll be able to um, to actually apply a narrative to um, a, what can be any kind of email. Okay. So have a look at this. Pause the video. Read through it. Try and take a guess what kind of structure we're using here. Our clients expect the best in product quality, so we emphasize reliability, availability in our distribution network. This ensures we can guaranteed, guarantee all the features you need. Pause the video. What kind of structure do you think this is? Okay, so this is an inverted 
pyramid. We start with the most general, the be best in product quality, emphasize reliability and availability in a distribution network. And we go from the most general, oh, sorry. So this is a pyramid structure. We start off with specific points and then we move with uh, move down into the most general. So we start with best in product quality, emphasize reliability and availability in our distribution network. This is very, very specific. It goes at the top, it's a pyramid structure. And then we finally end with, this ensures we can guarantee all the features you need. This is very, very general. We go from specific to general, it's a pyramid structure. Okay, how about this one? The negotiation went well yesterday. Today, we've spent time agreeing delivery terms. Tomorrow morning, we will draw up a contract and hopefully get it signed by the end of the week. Pause the video. What kind of structure do you think this is? If you said chronological uh, time order, then you're absolutely right. We start yesterday, we focus on today, then tomorrow morning, and then by the end of the week, we move through time order. Okay. Let's have a look at this one. Uh, to log into the system, enter your username, type in your password, answer the security question, enter the four-digit security code. What structure do you think this is? This is a process sequence. We start with number one, move on to number two, three, and four, walk you through the different steps, exactly what you need to do at every stage of the process. Okay. Have a look at this one. Read through it, pause the video, read through it. Apologies for not making it to the meeting yesterday. This was due to a major problem at our plant in Cologne. Fortunately, I contacted Jan, who, forward, who forwarded me the main conclusions reached in the meeting. I'll be at head office next week to finalize the details. So what kind of structure is this? This is, of course, a problem solution. Um, fortunately, the problem was there was a major problem at the plant. She wasn't able to make the meeting. The solution was that we contacted Jan and he was able to fill in all the details. He'll be available next week. Okay? We had a problem, wasn't able to go to the meeting. The solution was basically we contacted Jan and will be available uh, next week to finalize the details. That's the solution. That's the happy ending to the story. Okay. Again, Another example of a problem solution. Several employees have recently had problems with remote internet, internet access. This was due to a change in access protocol. Employees now require a smart card issued by the IT department. Again, this is the solution here. Employees have had a problem. It's slightly different, um, but we've got a department actually fixing the problem for us now. And then we move on. So we go from problem to solution. And this last one, the team leader has built on her motivational qualities by using an interview approach to her personal development reviews. This has resulted in a higher performing development team. So again, pause the video. What kind of structure do you think this is? So if you said that this was a story, you are absolutely right. We have a beginning. The team leader has built on her motivational qualities. She's used the middle, she's used the interview questions to, uh, in her approach to personal development interviews. And then the final, uh, the, final the, the end of the story is that this has resulted in a higher performing departmental team. Okay, um, in terms of making our writing flow, we need to think about how we're actually going to connect together the ideas in a paragraph. The reader needs to follow the internal structure of the document and the connections between the writer's ideas. This was taken from uh, a textbook that I've been using for this course, English for Business Writing by Collins ELT. And it really sums up how we're able to connect things together. So. Let's have a look at the structure of sentences and paragraphs here. 
sentences, shorter sentences that you write, then people are actually uh, prefer to write shorter sentences because they're actually able to make less mistakes. There are, there are fewer mistakes in there. Um, shorter sentences does not actually mean simpler sentences. There is some value in the conciseness. Uh, to be concise and to be succinct, there is some value in that. This does not mean that our, our sentences need to be simple. It does mean that they need to be short. You can use a mix of complex and simple sentences um, varying when you need to actually show your authority and show your knowledge of something and then use the simpler sentences to actually explain things back to the reader who might not actually understand that complex process. Simple sentences will give an impression, it will be a lighter tone, it will be um, easier to read, they won't be as in-depth and um, difficult to actually plough through with all the relative clauses that you've got in there. Um, complex sentences, again, I think this is the thing that most um, second language learners will want to be able to focus on because it does give an air of professional tone. So let's have a look at some sentence structures here, some example sentences. Um, this product was launched 10 years ago. This is a simple sentence. Intersearch is investing huge sums in research and development and QMX has bought a number of smaller providers in various countries. This is a compound sentence, just in case anybody's having, we're just in a very brief grammar review here. And a complex sentence, Intersearch and then the relative clause. We've got the minor and mi major and minor clauses here. Intersearch, which entered the market only a few years ago, is investing huge sums of money in research and development. This is a complex sentence here. So we go through and we see that there are varying levels of tone, various levels of, of basically professionalism that basically come through here in using these sentences. Complex sentences, therefore, are sentences that have two or more clauses. Again, this is something that is quite difficult for us Chinese second language learners to appreciate, is that we don't link together clauses. We do nest clauses inside each other. There are major and minor information that we reference to within a sentence. Um, we use these clauses in this way. Complex sentences will have ideas that are linked together with either a subordinating pronoun or a relative um, or a relative pronoun. It, try that again. Complex sentences have ideas that are linked together with either a relative pronoun or a subordinating conjunction. So we'll have things like who, that, which, what, when, were. These will all link the ideas together within the clauses. Subordinating con conjunctions will be things like because, as, if, and then, when, as, before, after, after, before, etc., etc., etc. So linking ideas together within sentences, being, being able to make these complex sentences and compound sentences will help enormously. Using conjunctions. You can use conjunctions in a very, very powerful ways within emails. Okay? Um, you can have things like, for example, they set up the company five months ago, but they've already gone bankrupt. Although they set up the company five years ago, they've already gone bankrupt. And finally, they only set up the company five months ago, semicolon, however, they've already gone bankrupt. So each of these, we're using conjunctions in different ways to link information in the sentences. And you can, you can actually feel that there's the simpler sentences at the top using just a simple but is actually more accessible and probably more informal. And then as we go further down, as we get to the bottom, uh, the bottom one with the use of the semicolon, the advanced use of this kind of punctuation does give a more professional um, tone to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the writing. Connecting sentences, there are two types of, there are two ways that you can connect sentences. You can use logical connectors which connect ideas together or you can use chronological connectors which link things together in time order. So logical connectors as a result in contrast in addition to 
chronological connectors that probably Chinese speakers will be using a lot more of, first, second, after that, finally. Um, if you want to appear more professional in your email writing, you'll be looking at using logical connectors more than these uh, chronological sequence connectors. So let's have a look at how you can link things together in logical order. I'll have a look at this paragraph here. Just take a little bit of time to look at the uh, things that I've uh, highlighted in bold here. Um, you'll need to be able to uh, look at how things are linked together logically rather than in time order. So we launched the new products at a time when competition is fierce. Therefore, it was difficult for us to get unanimous commitment from all the senior management. In addition, the high interest rates at the time made it hard for us to get the necessary financial backing. However, after lengthy negotiations, we were able to probably secure the funding. Okay. So, however, in addition, therefore, these all link ideas from one to the other and we get a more natural flow. If we started using this chronologically, then say first we had this, second is this, it wouldn't really work because these three things came together at the same time and you couldn't really separate them out into a sequence. So be aware that normally there'll be one event or usually there'll be one event which will have three or four causes and you'll have to, tr to be able to separate those out into time order is going to be very, very difficult. It's probably better for you to re rely on sorting them into a logical order to actually get a better flow in your emails. So therefore, in this sentence here, means that the cause was in the previous sentence and the result is in the present sentence. So we will have one sentence stating the cause, start the new sentence with therefore and include the result in the present sentence that we're reading right now. In addition, extra information that was present in, extra information in the present sentence can be combined with information from the previous sentence. So again, we're not putting things in time order, but we're linking things together in logic. We're going backwards and forwards, and you can't really do that in time. So you can do it in logic, okay? However, you're showing a contrast between expected outcome based on information in the previous clause. So it's unexpected information that we didn't expect. Previous clause or previous sentence, you can start the new sentence with however, and the actual outcome is stated in the previous, in the present sentence that we're reading right now. So A happened, however, A was expected, however, B is what happened. We put that together in the present sentence that we're reading right now. Chronological connectors, you might be able to put a sequence of events into time order. So just uh, take a look at this particular uh, paragraph here that I've got for you. Um, I would like to go over the action plan before our next meeting so that we are aligned on the next steps. In the first sentence, we highlight this idea that we've got steps to go through. First of all, you will need to extract the sales figures from P&L account. Step one. Next. These figures will require some analysis so that we can see where the major sales outlet will be. Very, very uh, rarely used logic, uh, chronological connector here that I don't see very often from Chinese students. At the same time, we will be in a better position to identify where we have incurred significant costs. So at the same time, you separated it out into chronological order, but then you're actually able to talk about two things happening at the same time. Finally, I would like you to put the figures into a spreadsheet and circulate them to the whole team. So we've separated out the sequence into time order. This is more of a sequence of a process. So we're looking at step one, step two, step three, step four, and then step five, finally at the end. We're able to do that, but we're not able to do um, this with all of our written work. We're not able to do the, all of this with our spoken work either. Replacement words. You need to be able to have um, a grasp of vocabulary here, okay? So you need to be able to use replacement words, synonyms, to avoid repetition 
and avoid being boring. This is how you avoid being boring in, in English. Okay. Sales were well above target. They reached. We don't repeat the word sales in the sentence. Okay. We can use they, the sales. We reference back. I think this, is, this causes a, few, a bit of confusion, especially for learners of second language. It. If we've already defined what it is, the car, something, 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 it was able to. We're able to drop the actual uh, noun and use a pronoun instead. Three million euros, and this represents a 10% rise on last year. So three million euros, this and they, we replace the pronoun with things like this and they, and we're able to actually make our language a little bit more interesting. Text flags. Um, text flags or signposts, you might know these as. They show people where the important information is. Um, if you've done any kind of academic writing course, uh, you will know that this signposting is very, very important in academic writing because it tells people where the important information is coming up. Now, these are only used in written English and they're only used really with uh, some kind of graphical supplement, um, a bar chart or a chart or a diagram. Um, above, below, in paragraph 10.2, overleaf, in section 34, on the previous page, on the next page. These signposts actually show physically where the information is on the page. Um, you can use that, but you have to make sure that you've actually got the graphical information, the chart, the diagram, actually on the page that you're referring to. So be aware of layout again as you're, as you're, um, as you're writing uh, your, your document here. Paragraphs. Uh, there is a lot of confusion, um, especially because mostly in Chinese, the amount of information that can be relayed in one sentence in Chinese is probably much more than a sentence uh, in English. Paragraphs have one theme, one idea per paragraph. We're normally looking at five or six sentences per paragraph, okay? That is it. One main point, five or six sentences to illustrate that point. They are essential for long documents. You can't have a big, long block of text. It's really, really difficult to read through, okay? You can use headings and you can use bullet points to make things clearer, although do be warned, we don't do this in academic writing, okay? For example, I'm gonna show you an example here. Uh, we've got an example of how information has been broken up. You don't really need to spend much time. Don't, don't strain your eyes trying to look at this example. It just shows you how a lot of information can be broken down into paragraphs of a sentence or less. And you can use bullet points in order to actually get across a certain point, break things down in a logical order for the reader. Highlighted here, I hope you can see this um, as, as well as I can. Highlighted here are the different ways that the author has broken down the information to make it more accessible to the reader. Um, straight away, they've used headings. They've said, what's the change? This is the question that all the employees will be asking. Further down, you can see in pink, the highlighted, that they've actually gone through different points, point one, point two, point three, and then at the bottom, the next steps or the next stages part, they've actually used bullet points to illustrate and make clear these next points. There's not a lot of storytelling language. There's not much of a narrative here, okay? So we're trying to get the information to the employees as quickly and as concisely as possible. Bullet points are a great way. Bullet points are a great way of getting that information across. Headings are a great way of getting that information across. Breaking things down into point one, point two, point three is another great way of doing this. You can use this in your email writing. Don't use this in your academic writing. You won't get a high score on the IELTS, okay? If you try and do this. Formal writing, features of formal writing in terms of getting your style right. We need to be looking at longer words. We need to be thinking about Latin and vocabulary. Formal writing is often impersonal and very direct. There is more use of the passive voice 
there is more use of the perfect tense is something happened over a period of time and there's more use of punctuation. These are things that we need to look for in our formal writing. Okay. Standard professional writing, we need to be looking at shorter, more direct phrases, simple questions. Where do we go from now? What are the next steps? Illustrate the next steps. Okay. Less formal vocabulary. Personal and direct. You can talk about things coming from me to you. We need to own these issues. We need to own this, um, own this direction that we're going into is what people say. In that we need to say that I did this and I think this is the best way of doing it. We need to be able to look at that. Um, proficient language uh, use is expected. When we're talking about proficient language use, we mean that we're able to communicate to adults as adults. Why should we avoid Chinglish? This can be interpreted a lot as baby talk. And it really does, it really, the, the tone, I think I illustrated this very, very briefly in the first lecture, the tone really kind of mismatches when you try to use baby language or patronizing language in a formally uh, written document. This really does kind of tend to create problems with uh, a lot of confusion and, and can cause some offense as well. Informal writing, we need to be looking at conversational expressions. We need to be looking at slang as well. So if we've got any, if we've got any conversational expressions, if we've got any slang in our writing, it's too informal. We need to remove that, okay? There's less structure and mistakes are more acceptable. Um, discussion forums on the internet are a great example. Um, the language is very informal. People try and replicate conversational English in things like um, internet language, like LOL, um, they will try to be more conversational, more informal, uh, especially on these, um, especially on the internet forums where they don't, uh, not expected to write as formally. Getting the tone right, getting your style right, you need to think, are you pushing or are you pulling? Um, are you putting pressure on your employees or are you actually getting them to perform at their best. A good example of pushing, send it, send it now. If you don't send it, you'll get fired. You don't need to threaten people to actually get the information. You can replace that with, do me a favor and get it to me ASAP. If you send it, we can try and salvage what's left of the deal. So we're not blaming anybody in the pulling section, in the pulling language, we're not blaming anybody. We're trying to make sure that everybody can come together and we can actually bring a solution. Um, based on everybody working together as a team. We're not blaming someone for being an idiot, okay? Always try to pull, don't try to push, okay? We strongly recommend that you can be replaced with one option you can consider. Make that person make the decision, okay? He'll feel better for it if he makes the decision based on your recommendation. The report you sent is totally inadequate. Try to consider replacing this with one. Can we meet this afternoon to go over some of the points in the report? I think it could benefit for some small changes. Okay. So don't, pu don't push people. That normally has the negative effect. Try and pull the best performance out of people. Okay. One thing that we can use um, is that we can use positive language. Always try and use positive language. We always try and avoid negative language in our correspondence, okay? Things like busy, crisis, failure. Replace that with actively, agreed, evolving, fast. Um, one thing that you would never say is you would never say I'm busy. Always try and highlight that you're being productive. Can't, won't, impossible, incompetent, never, stupid. Consider replacing these with good question, helpful, manageable. It's a positive language. Don't try and be negative. Nobody likes, nobody likes this negation. Nobody likes this pessimism. Unreasonable, pointless, waste of time, waste of money, waste of effort. Work together. Use the tools. Bring the team together. Look at the benefits. Okay. Again, positive language. Pulling often accomplishes more than pushing. When you're writing, you've got to think about the four C's. Clear, concise, complete, and correct information has to be in your emails at all times. Clarity, be specific. Don't be too general. Don't say, you know. We don't know 
tell us what it is, okay? Avoid vague expressions. We, uh, this, this can be considered quite rude in Chinese, I understand, but we do actually expect this in English. Use familiar words. Don't blind people with acronyms and jargon. Don't do this. Conciseness. Avoid unnecessary explanations. Don't talk down to people. Don't be patronizing. Avoid wordiness, avoid repetition, avoid long words. This will always kind of work against you. I know that you want to show that you're the boss and you know everything. You're not helping the situation if no one can understand what your email is about. Courtesy, you language, don't use we, don't use I, okay? Be tactful, think of the other person's emotions. And don't use irritating expressions. This, this will really rub people the wrong way. Okay. Completeness. Talking about dates, times, names. Include all of these things. Room numbers, telephone numbers. Make sure you get all the information in there. Double check that all these, inf all these numbers are correct as well. So don't give someone the wrong, the wrong email address. Don't tell someone the wrong room number. Proofread. Spell check, check the pronunciation, check the punctuation, okay? Always, always proofread. Just read over one more time what you've written. Don't be afraid of doing that. Correctness, make sure you're spelling people's names right. People spell my name wrong all the time. It's a basic thing. Um, make sure that you're getting the punctuation right, that you're not putting full stops in the middle of a sentence, things like that. Use the correct grammar. There's nothing more confusing than trying to figure out whether someone meant today or yesterday or they're trying to figure out if it was written. We use the grammar to indicate time, so you know, be aware of that. Adapt your language to the reader. This is, this is really vital. You need to really make sure that you're accommodating people. Less is often more. You can use simpler language in place of more complex language. Don't be afraid of doing this. If it helps you, don't be afraid of that, okay? We already know you're the boss. You don't need to broadcast that. You're the boss because you're supposed to be good at communicating. Good communication is using simple language. At this point in time, just say no, okay? In the near future, just say soon. Take into consideration, just say consider, okay? You don't need to use these wordy phrases, okay? Don't confuse your phrases, don't confuse words, don't confuse currently with presently, don't confuse actual with current, okay? Make sure you know the difference between these words. You can give the wrong idea. For example, there's a, there's a classic, classic mistake that people use in China. It has to be done by Thursday. So does this mean by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, or does this mean by Thursday, 5 p.m.? Be specific. Don't confuse these terms. If there's any room for confusion, make sure that you actually tell people a deadline, okay? If there is a deadline, don't just say by Tuesday. It doesn't tell anybody anything that. Make sure um, there are some commonly used abbreviations. One of the problems with abbreviations and jargon is that um, they will be common, the, 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 some will be commonly known, some of them will be widely known, some of them won't be uh, as, as widely known. Um, especially in China, um, APP and APP, there are some things that sound like acronyms that you don't really use as acronyms in English. And um, things like AGM, FYI, RSVP. RSVP is a weird one because it's actually French. Uh, make sure that, um, if some things, this will just basically come through exposure to English and then you'll see the same acronyms and you see the same abbreviations over and over again. If in doubt, please do explain the abbreviations if they're technical, but don't patronize people. You don't need to tell people what ASAP means, okay? So it's a judgment call, but you do need to actually expose yourself to as much English as possible and as much written work as possible to be able to know what is widely known and what is not. Finally, uh, to sum up what we've gone over in this particular lecture, use words you know, use words that your readers will know, okay? Avoid jargon unless it's expected, unless you're actually talking to someone who knows what it means. If the reader doesn't share your area of expertise, I think we talked about this in the Tone and Register lecture, if we don't share your area of expertise, 
do explain things to people, don't patronize people. Okay. Remember the writing process. You need to th plan before you write. You need to think about who will be reading your writing, structuring your information, pyramid, inverted pyramid, chronological order, storytelling, process. Select the appropriate rewrite, select the appropriate information. And finally, draft, draft, redraft, rewrite, redraft, draft, draft, rewrite it. Hit send at the last possible moment, okay? You should probably stop at point number three. Don't focus on language. Get the information on the paper, okay? So get the information down on the paper. Don't focus on the language. You've got to really kind of get past your embarrassment, really. Um, focus on conciseness. Focus on clarity. Focus on correctness and appropriateness of the language. Edit the information and the structure if you need to. And then move on to editing the language. Proofread as much as you can. This is the send button most of the time. It's the oh god, I've just seen a big mistake in the information there. Um, this, the classic example that you, you make when you're sending emails is that you will send an email correcting someone's information and you'll actually have a mistake in that email that you're sending to the person. It's not the oops button, it's the send button. Okay, so please be aware of this. Proofread draft. I know it's just an email, but it does need to be rewritten as much as possible. Some useful resources that you might find um, expand on the points that I actually touched on in this particular lecture. English for Business Writers, the Collins ELT is a vital resource. Uh, you should be looking at that. Um, business Minimax, um, English for Business Writing, this is something that I think you'll be able to find a PDF of this on the internet. If you can't, um, York Associates will have a copy for you. Go and search out this book. It is really, really good. And finally, Email English by Macmillan. Macmillan are one of the big English language um, textbook uh, suppliers. So, th I mean, these guys really know this stuff and they're, they're, they're really, really, um, you know, it really is worth spending the money on getting a decent reference book that you have on your shelf. Homework task for this lecture is, I would like you to write a response to this email. Imagine that you've just moved to a new city. Dale City. We know that there are many things that you need to, need to know about. You need to write a reply. Ask a couple of questions maybe, even if you don't really need, want to know the answers. Write an email back to this housing association in Dale City. We'll give you a sample email answer at the beginning of next lecture. Okay, so thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the final lecture, number five, which will be writing CVs and personal statements. Thank you very much.